which is called uh, Set by Design. It's actually the launch of uh, Gert's uh, latest book. And uh, this is the reason why it looks a little bit uh, dark, but we're going to talk about sadness. So uh, he thought this would be a great setting, OK? So please bear with us with the darkness. Anyway, OK, welcome everyone to this uh, last lecture of this cycle that uh, the comedy department uh, organized. For this semester, which is called Digital Delights and Disturbances. And uh, we have the honor of uh, last but not least, uh, Jeff Loving uh, here at GCU. It's actually coming back because in 2016, uh, uh, Professor Sam and I and the Com Department organized together with uh, Roma Tree University and Teresa Numerico and the INC, uh, the Institute of Network Cultures in Amsterdam, Gerst's uh, uh, Institute. We uh, organized this uh, conference, uh, which was called Fear and Loathing of the Online Self. I mean, the title is quite, <laughs> it's a little bit, we are in this kind of like direction, taking this direction, set by design, uh, fear and loathing, it looks like very scary. <laughs> but anyway, so we had the honor of hosting this conference here at GCU and uh, Romate, 
and it was a great conference where we had like uh, international speakers uh, and lots of artists, also scholars, uh, uh, coming here to discuss. And from that conference, actually, we we are creating a lot of things. Like uh, we are co-editing a book about the online self. Uh, we do have a class right now here uh, of, of, about selfies. Uh, so I, I guess it was like amazing at the start of a very interesting collaboration with uh, Gert and uh, Teresa. And we do hope to host more events in the future. Uh, so I now just want to say that, uh, well, so Gert is a, is a friend, he's a scholar, he's an activist. So this is a very important part of his life. Um, it's very difficult to sum up uh, all the experiences that Gert has. But I mean, I just want to say Gert is an amazing uh, internet. Uh, th this is the way you like to present yourself, right? A net, uh, net uh, not scholar. Critic, yes, net critic. Okay, so we're gonna have like the pleasure of hosting uh, uh, Gert Loving's talk, uh, which is about uh, uh, his last book, uh, which is gonna come out uh, in a month, right? With uh, Pluto Press. Uh, it's called Sub by Design uh, on Platform Nihilism. And I had the pleasure to read the book already, and uh, it's everything but sad. It's actually quite. Uh, quite uh, energetic uh, critic of the contemporary digital culture. But so we're gonna hear from Gert and then we leave the room for Q&A. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so we'll, uh, I'm going to be back here in Rome at John Carter um, and um, to present you uh, all this new work for you uh, here tonight. Um, the presentation consists of three parts. First, I'm going to quickly go through uh, the latest developments uh, and projects that we do at the Institute of Natural Cultures. Uh, in the second part, uh, I will do the uh, global launch of my new book, because uh, I'm here to, pre to present the Italian translation of Sam by Design which comes out two months before the English. Um, so that's, in itself, is, uh, it's interesting. Um, the book will also be out soon in Spanish and German. Um, then, uh, in the third part, I'm going to read uh, uh, sections from the actual sad by design uh, chapter. Okay, so uh, that's uh, about the program for tonight. Uh, here you see the, uh, the website, networkcultures.org, uh, of my institute that uh, I was uh, very happy to uh, start in uh, 2004 when I came back from uh, Australia, where I did my PhD. Um, um, uh, we've been uh, running this uh, very small place, it's only one room, so I don't think it's big, uh, we are with three sometimes four people, and we have some interns, so if you want to come and join us, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, and and uh, we are building up these research networks, initiatives uh, uh, that we do uh, across the globe with a lot of uh, partners, scholars, internet, uh, critics, designers, programmers, um, and uh, I'm going to go quickly through uh, a few of them. Uh, the, one of the oldest one and most successful one uh, is a video vortex. And uh, after the uh, um, uh, edition that you see here uh, in the south of India um, um, within um, uh, last year, uh, we are going uh, to have uh, a video vortex again. Uh, the 25th and 27th uh, of September, uh, not very far away from here, in uh, Malta. So, um, if you want to come and uh, join us, or if you want to present something there, Video Vortex is a network that deals with the politics and aesthetics of online video, uh, YouTube, and so on and so on, right? But nowadays we have uh, Facebook Video, we have so many, many other ways to share uh, moving images. But of course, the most uh, important one uh, is uh, YouTube. So you could call this also YouTube studies. I don't, I don't mind. 
Um, uh, this is a very important field and it asks a very simple question. Uh, what is the difference between online video in comparison to uh, cinema, uh, film uh, and uh, of course television? And uh, you know, what, what is this? Uh, what does it mean that you are watching a database? What does it mean uh, that you are recommended uh, all these videos? What does it mean uh, that um, you know there's still a lot of space for community and for comments and uh, for uh, debate or uh, trolling, or whatever uh, you know happens uh, in that uh, very very busy space? Of course, we are we see a lot of developments there happening uh, in terms of uh, streaming. Uh, just think of uh, Christchurch recently, uh, which was a stream, which was an online, uh, you know, streaming, uh, online video event, right? Let's face it. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, yeah, there are other uh, developments. Think of the use of drones. Uh, everywhere we go, uh, of course, the uh, very old uh, classics stuff is happening as well, like surveillance cameras. Uh, all, all this is, is what we could call you know, video spaces, and this, uh, this is uh, expanding uh, very, very rapidly, not only in society, but also uh, online. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a, a, a project that we really like, but that's really going nowhere. Um, because, uh, <laughs> yeah, it deals with a question that nobody wants to uh, deal with anymore. Uh, and that's uh, search, search engines. We all use search engines, we all use Wikipedia, uh, but um, they are uh, completely pushed in the background. And they, what well, in the book I call, is kind of a, becoming a, an unconscious techno infrastructure and that we use, but we don't even notice that we use it, right? It's, it's so fast, it, it, we always presume it's there, right? And also, uh, we don't, uh, really uh, pursue any uh, serious studies into it anymore, right? It's impossible to find uh, funding for, for research into this, right? which is uh, in itself uh, interesting. Uh, what, what we could so call, say the same uh, about social media, although there is a lot of uh, social media research happening, um, <clears throat> we can see that uh, the um, uh, so let's say critical approaches and the uh, especially the question, you know, what alternatives that there are for the for the dominating uh, social media platforms uh, is a, is one that has uh, been stagnated, uh, well at least until Cambridge Analytica, let's say, until uh, early last year, right? Uh, this uh, project that we started um, during the protest uh, year of 2011, called Unlike Us. Uh, deals with the questions, uh, what are uh, alternatives in social media, right? Okay, we can complain about Facebook, Google, and so on and so on, but how do we uh, envision uh, another uh, social media architecture, right? And that question is really open. But, as you may notice, uh, we're already eight years into this question, and we have not made a lot of progress, no, let's face it. Uh, in fact, we have uh, faced uh, even setbacks uh, of, a, of a field that is uh, already quite small, right? So this is really a, a very good example of, uh, of what, uh, you know, in, in the social science is called a regression, a society that com comes to a complete standstill and regresses uh, backwards, right? So um, in the past, maybe you remember or not, but uh, we used to migrate from MySpace to this and to that, right? Uh, people were very mobile when it comes to uh, the use, but that's no longer. And the lock-in effect of the of this dominating social media platforms uh, has been total, and we are all literally uh, locked in. Um, okay, well, maybe there is some change happening, okay, in the last uh, uh, couple, maybe year, may, maybe. Uh, well, we can we can discuss. Uh, I don't know how many people here use Mastodon, uh, Signal, Telegram, etc., uh, etc. Et if you use DuckDuckGo, I don't know, but uh, yes, uh, they, there is a change happening, uh, only uh, a small one. Then, of course, yes, uh, Donatella mentioned it already. Um, 
Yeah, this, uh, and this is an important uh, uh, aspect also of my work, and uh, we're trying to give this uh, a shape, yeah? to have a critical look uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the formations of the online itself. And uh, <coughs> this is, a, for me, a very uh, important aspect. And we, we, we almost go back to the very early, early days of cultural studies there, right? In the mid, let's, let's say, 70s, some, something like that. When popular culture was discovered, uh, and uh, it was very, very important at that moment to lo not look down on popular culture anymore, but from a critical perspective, completely embrace it and to look and to work from within. Uh, and this is a bit a difficult movement, and you'll see I, I'm trying to make that uh, here tonight as well, to have an empathy in the critical position. And this is, uh, this is really the, the, the difficult steps, right? Because we can look down on all those suckers who are still on Facebook, who still use Instagram, and so on and so on, right? It, 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 we can uh, very, very easily uh, develop some kind of um, elitist, avant-garde, European, offline uh, kind of uh, mood where you look down on all the billions and think, oh, those poor suckers. Uh, okay, uh, this, in my view, uh, leads nowhere and it's very, very important to study uh, our current cultures of stagnation, right? And we are very, very much in the, in the midst of a very, very deep stagnation. Uh, and so the question how to get out of that uh, is, a, is an important one and uh, I'm very, very open for uh, suggestions. Uh, there is another uh, level where we do make uh, progress, and that's in itself interesting, um, and that's the question of how uh, we are going to make a living in the 21st century uh, online, right? Uh, and this is a very, very important one, especially for, you, for young people, um, and this project is called Money Lab. Uh, we started this uh, in 2013. And here you look at uh, Money Lab, uh, which happened last month. The first uh, one in uh, Germany was quite successful. Um, and the next one is coming in Amsterdam. So if you want to come and join it, it's in November 14 and 15. So number seven is uh, November 14 and 15 in Amsterdam. Uh, and we there deal with uh, a lot of uh, let's say, utopian and critical projects related to Bitcoin, blockchain, crowdfunding, um, a universal basic income, uh, all, the, all the new forms of, uh, on, let's say, new digital money, uh, online uh, uh, payments, uh, think of, uh, you know, how to, uh, I don't know if you are selling clothes on, uh, on Instagram, uh, maybe some of you do, so uh, then you will uh, know uh, what what I'm talking about, right? Um, and these are th these are not the the classical late 90s e-commerce systems uh, where you pay with a credit card uh, through the original banking system, right? Th this uh, space that is opening up and growing very rapidly is is uh, asking the question: How we can go beyond that? How we can establish? Uh, let's say value transactions peer to peer uh, between uh, us. Okay, so that's uh, that's Money Lab. Uh, this is uh, currently our biggest uh, uh, project, uh, more most active one, uh, let's say. And <coughs> yeah, here you look at the, the website. Okay, something new uh, that I have not uh, uh, mentioned um, um, is uh, is this new space. Uh, it's called Ed Grow, Temporary Design Space. Uh, it opens this week uh, with this manifesto that uh, I wrote uh, after Sad by Design, uh, when uh, the book was ready. Uh, me and Mika Kelletje, uh, the designer that I uh, uh, have the pleasure of working together with since uh, 1991, um, we, uh, we are uh, taking over this space, the people of Droog, they are retiring and they have, uh, for, for the time being, given this in, immense big uh, gallery uh, in, right in the old town of Amsterdam uh, for about a year. 
And yeah, the, uh, the manifesto which deals with the question of the proliferation of design, uh, everything is designed, it's very uh, a Dutch and Italian question, and mm -hmm. this is where uh, Italians and Dutch mm -hmm. have very, very much uh, in common and to say and to exchange on this question of the status of design in the everyday life. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so this manifesto uh, and the, the, the actual text, uh, I'm not sure, but it, I, I think it will become available as a PDF uh, in, a, in about a week or so. So, the, the, so that's um, soon. So this is, uh, yeah, news. Um, also, uh, something that I want to uh, say something about, uh, it's an invitation if you're interested. Uh, this is our big event. We, we do a two-year uh, research program. It's applied research, so it's not scientific. It's applied uh, research in the Netherlands between three schools, uh, Arnhem, Artes, uh, de Pietzwart, and Willem de Koning in Rotterdam, and us in Amsterdam. And uh, this is a network that deals with uh, experiments in digital publishing. Uh, maybe a lot of you uh, will know us from our publications. Uh, all of them are available online. Uh, you can read them on your, te on your telephone uh, in the EPUB format. You, they are available in PDF, in web readers. Uh, sometimes they are also in paper, sometimes not. And that, of course, depends a little bit on, uh, on the budget. And uh, we come together uh, in Arnhem uh, on the 15th to 17th of, um, of May to discuss what we call urgent publishing. Urgent publishing asks the simple question, how can we speed up critical uh, publishing uh, but not losing uh, quality, right? So this is a, a question in the, in the age of online. And if you know something about how arcane scholarly publishing is and that it takes many, many years to pr produce a book, uh, uh, you will know that uh, you know, if you want to make a critical difference with, uh, with your thinking, with your output, uh, uh, the traditional ways of doing that are very, very slow. And once, when it is out, you, you have already moved on and the situation has completely changed. It's very frustrating, right? And it's been like that already for decades and there's almost no progress there. Uh, another uh, um, example of this, of this culture of uh, stagnation. So we feel uh, that in, the, in these urgent times when Europe is falling apart with the rise of right-wing movements, um, uh, and, and the rise of nationalism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, we feel that it's very, very uh, urgent to uh, think about distrib distribution channels that uh, are fast and accurate. Um, and uh, yes, uh, for that, we also look at Instagram. We look at uh, the, the question of uh, memes. We look at uh, uh, the integration of online video, but also online publishing uh, in the more traditional sense. Okay, now I want to uh, go to uh, the next part. Uh, and that's um, my book. Here you see um, the one uh, from 2012, uh, also translated in Italian. It's called Networks Without Accords. And here you can see a little bit uh, you know the what the kind of structure I I have uh, this is uh, this is number four and uh, then comes number five this is number five of the of this series uh, so I have a series of books uh, and sad by design uh, is number six in this series of uh, studies in critical internet culture and they're uh, basically uh, built up in a similar way. Uh, I collect uh, essays uh, and they give kind of an overview uh, of, uh, of, what, I, of, what, of why, what I consider uh, important uh, in terms of internet uh, culture. Uh, of course, there are other uh, you know, important topics, but uh, I, I can't deal uh, with all of them. So necessarily, here you see uh, social uh, media abyss. Uh, necessarily they, um, they 
look at certain uh, aspects. Of course, the social media critique lately uh, is a very, very uh, important one, uh, but also for us, uh, you know, the merger uh, of, uh, let's say, internet infrastructures and payment infrastructures is also a very, very important one that looks uh, in well uh, into the future. Uh, so uh, here you can see uh, number chapter five, six, uh, and seven, for instance, uh, deal uh, with this uh, money question. Um, the, the money lab agenda and the future of Bitcoin uh, and so on and so on uh, and usually I close uh, the books with some strategic remarks that are re uh, related to the question of uh, what's to be done uh, the question of activism right? because uh, the people that uh, I consider my audience are people who are uh, active they are not just following, they are not just consuming, uh, they are shaping uh, the field as we, as we speak. Uh, and of course, you, we can uh, ask ourselves, uh, are we still able uh, to, uh, you know, to define this field, even though you know, we are maybe not as powerful as Mark Zuckerberg, but okay. He also started off uh, once uh, in uh, you know, a bedroom like, uh, like yours. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, yes, uh, and that's not very long uh, ago, but we can say, okay, but, uh, you know, a lot has changed in those uh, 15 years. But maybe not, right? Uh, maybe uh, there are still possibilities uh, where we can interview, uh, intervene, where we can make uh, a difference, where we can come up uh, with radically different uh, uh, proposals and articles. Um, in between, there's a, there's a book that came out last year, I, I do want to mention it here because um, it's an organization after social media and these are my collected writings together with Ned Rossiter from Sydney. Uh, over a 10 year period we have been working on this strategic, uh, more activist question of organization. Uh, the key concept here is called uh, organized networks and organized networks are an alternative to uh, the dominant platforms that are all based on the exploitation of weak links. And you know what weak links are, right? The, uh, the network is building up uh, by adding uh, friends of friends of friends. Remember when you uh, uh, upload your entire uh, address book uh, uh, and uh, give it all away, right? Well, that's precisely the moment uh, when uh, Facebook, Google and all the others can build up, LinkedIn is also very good at that, uh, those networks of networks, those links, uh, with, and, and spread out um, so that uh, uh, they uh, can start to map, uh, map you, uh, uh, even though you think that you are uh, you know, empowering yourself, and certainly uh, in the very beginning it felt like that, right? I mean, network and networking felt really powerful at some point in time. Maybe that's no longer the case. Um, okay, so uh, this book, uh, by the way, this is my first book that you can officially buy in the bookstore, but is officially available online as free PDF. So, <laughs> and also, um, it was for me a real breakthrough, uh, which I have not yet re uh, uh, achieved. Uh, with most of my books, but uh, you know, I really, really try hard to make uh, to make a progress uh, there. And so um, it's very, very uh, courageous of publishers, as you can imagine, uh, to do that. Okay, then uh, we come to the actual launch tonight, the global launch uh, of uh, book number six. Sad by design on classical <coughs> nihilism, and in particular, Nihilismo Digitale, La Trafaccia della Platforma, um, in Italian, uh, published by Bocconi, uh, in Jaya, um, uh, late March. So that's a while, uh, a while ago already, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so um, 
Yeah, I'm very uh, happy. The English one will be uh, available uh, mid May. So that's also soon. Okay, and now I'm going to um, stay for, for a little while um, here and uh, tell you a little bit about the background of this book. Uh, it came out relatively uh, soon. So there's only three years uh, between this book and this one, right? So this came out in 16, uh, and um, this one uh, in 19. Um, and I decided to do that because I felt that the, that the, the debate in society about social media, especially after Brexit, Trump, Cambridge Analytica, and so on and so on, all the Facebook uh, scandals that uh, uh, are happening as we speak, um, uh, is creating a whole new, uh, new climate, a new context uh, for discussions like this, uh, a, a context that has not happened uh, before. Uh, so uh, it's, it's never been that uh, you know, parliaments were discussing uh, regulating or even uh, you know breaking up uh, Facebook and Google that that just has not happened in the in the past couple of decades that's happening right now and this momentum is certainly there uh, in the UK even in the US uh, so uh, and yeah this was quite uh, in, unimaginable uh, even uh, you know two three years ago. So, so there, there, we are definitely uh, moving uh, in another direction. Now, the question is, of course, uh, you know, is this uh, a good thing? Uh, I'm all for uh, regulation, or, but uh, I think we should not lose, lose our time uh, with that, right? So I, I don't believe uh, that uh, this is going to go uh, anywhere un unless it's really, really done in a very, very systematic way, which I, I don't see uh, happening, right? So, for instance, uh, maybe you have followed it or not, this, this week there were uh, proposals in uh, the European Commission, uh, circles, um, some uh, advisors said, yeah, we should not uh, touch uh, Facebook and Google, but maybe they can share some of their data with competitors. Now, we know, we know that they don't have competitors, right? So, uh, so with whom uh, should we force them to share those data, right? Um, so this is already uh, a, a, pro a problem. If you believe in the market, if you are a liberal, uh, uh, that's all fine, but you know, they have destroyed the market. So uh, how can you uh, suggest that uh, you know, th this is, yeah. okay. So th I, I'm very skeptical if, if such uh, uh, propositions uh, will go anywhere. Okay, so then of course there is the, the question of uh, na nationalization, which might, may happen in some countries, we'll see. Uh, you know, of course there are uh, much, much larger geopolitical uh, developments happening, the closing off uh, also of uh, Russia. We, we, we are traditionally focused, of course, on the great uh, uh, firewall of China, right? But uh, uh, this model of the firewall, uh, the Great Firewall, is now replicated in many, many uh, countries, right? Um, it's happening uh, in Iran, it's happening in, um, in Russia, uh, and in many other countries. So, um, so the closing off of those very large uh, chunks has a, has a tremendous effect on, on the overall architecture of the internet. Okay, so th this is the context in which, uh, let's say, this book comes out. Uh, and uh, that's why I, I would start with the, the chapter Overcoming the Dissolution Internet. Uh, I think this is really uh, a chapter that deals with uh, the post-Brexit and Trump uh, atmosphere. Uh, like, uh, uh, if, you, if you seriously uh, study uh, the case of uh, Cambridge Analytica, it's very, very worrisome. Uh, okay, we can maybe some of you are uh, studying fake news or uh, you know the fake news in my uh, uh, in my understanding is only a very small part of a much much uh, bigger 
uh, phenomena that is happening because fake news is only focused on very, very specific political news in an election context, etc. Right? So, um, okay. So this is the dissolution internet. And this is very, very different, of course, from the utopian atmosphere, let's say, of the 90s or something like that. Right? Um, chapter two uh, is the, let's say, the Zizek uh, chapter, which um, uh, this is called the social media as ideology. And it, and it discusses the, the phenomena that is happening at the same time that the internet is becoming part of our everyday life and we don't notice it. We're online all the time, and uh, and this kind of embodiment of the ideology, embodiment uh, of the social media that are uh, really, really so close. Huh? It's so close to our our skin. It's so intimately connected uh, and with us, uh, day and night, right? Uh, and, and uh, in this chapter, I try to describe what it, what it means. And I use there the, the also quite old traditional um, notion of ideology uh, of uh, Louis Althusser. Um, and I, with, because I think that's still uh, um, you know, useful uh, in this uh, context to see it as an, as an apparatus that, is, uh, that, that we live in. And so it's not like what some people sometimes think and the old, let's say, young Marxian way of thinking of ideology as something that comes top down and it's, it is told by you, by the priest and by the father and by the authorities, etc. Right? No, it's not. The ideology it doesn't work anymore like that. It's not, uh, you know, top down anymore. It's lived. It's embodied. We live the social media. Uh, Chapter three is interesting because there I, I really tried for the first time to go in this uh, yeah, uh, new direction of, uh, let's say, empathic uh, criticism. Uh, to go deep into the question of uh, what is it, what does it mean when, when we are distracted, right? And the, the very important uh, sentence there is this, this kind of slogan. And it's called, we are not sick. Uh, the, the problem with distraction is, and the problem with the, the whole, the way of talking about it, is that there is an immediate medicalization of the other, right? You are using your phone too much, you are sick, you are addicted, you have to see a doctor, right? Now, and this is, this is a problem. Huh? Uh, because what happens when everybody here in this room uh, is addicted and has to see a doctor? Right? This, uh, yeah, and, and this, is a, this, is, this renders the whole uh, way of thinking, uh, you know, and it's going nowhere. Uh, because it means that we are, uh, in a way, asking the wrong, uh, the wrong question. So this is how I, did, I kind of use that as a starting point. Mm -hmm. So what, what if we are not sick, uh, we should approach uh, the whole phenomena in a radical, uh, different way. So this is what, uh, what I started, and then um, uh, I uh, and there I also go into this kind of um, yeah maybe I critique this kind of European offline romanticism of the digital detox, right? Uh, so if you, if you go uh, to the countryside for a weekend and then uh, you you leave your phone and your laptop at home. And then, yeah, you know, uh, and I know you, some of you have done uh, this experiment. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I don't believe uh, in it, and I don't think uh, this, is, uh, this is the way out, right? It's a very interesting uh, experiment to do, but I don't think uh, beyond, you know, doing it once, uh, it, it just doesn't uh, help us much. We need to uh, really think from inside, yeah, from inside, uh, the technology, the protocols, the designs, the human uh, in design interfaces, and so on and so on, right? We need to uh, make radical politics inside the phone. Okay. And this is how I got to uh, the, the chapter that I'm going to read uh, here, uh, or some parts of it, it's called Sci-Fi Design. Uh, then, uh, yeah, chapter five, I really like because it's a kind of a general framework 
and it's also biographic. I, I have to say, um, I don't like it so much, but <coughs> I, I'm invited, I'm not saying forced, but uh, invited to write more and more uh, biographical uh, stories, chapters. Hmm? And yeah, I, I, I haven't really dealt with that um, uh, demand or desire. I don't know if it really comes from me, from inside. I still have to. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm, I've, I've been uh, you know, in this internet sling now for 30 years. And yes, uh, uh, in that, those 30 years, I've, I've seen a lot of changes and done a lot of stuff. And yes, I have written a, a number of history books. Uh, for instance, I wrote the history of the Amsterdam Squatter Movement in the 1980s. Uh, it's called Squatting the Movement. Uh, yeah, and so the history and writing history is something I find really, really important with a personal angle. So uh, there you can see that media network uh, uh, platform is a, is a kind of a theoretical setup for that. Because these are the three terms that have defined my life. Of course, media. Oh, of course. Huh? I come from uh, the Scottish movement, from the alternative movement, the independent movement, and yes, uh, I have developed the concept of tactical media in the 90s, uh, and so on and so on. But also very many other, uh, uh, let's say, media definitions, such as uh, sovereign media, and so on. Okay, since the 90s, of course, I, I have been very involved in the development of a kind of a critical network theory. The net and I'm still building the network, and as you may have noticed, my institute is called the Institute of Network Cultures, right? And I'm still, I don't know if I'm still defending the network, but yeah, I'm still very, very much part of it. I, I, yeah, I would find it very, very difficult at this moment to say farewell to the network, right? To the network form, to the network politics, uh, and the network maybe, um, yeah, ideas um, uh, and promises that it still holds. Because, of course, nowadays we live, we don't live in the age of networks, we live in the, in the, in the dirty reality of platform capitalism, and that's our reality today, right? So uh, networks, uh, have thereby almost become rendered romantic. And, uh, you know, it's kind of nice, but yeah. We, uh, so maybe we should almost think of networks as some kind of uh, beautiful, cute uh, kind of things that happen in the countryside or something like that. <laughs> but uh, they are not, uh, they are not really part, <laughs> they are not part about our reality, right? And so, we are living uh, in the age of the, of the platforms, and uh, I have to confront myself with that in a radical way. So these are the three terms, and uh, I'm very interested in how these uh, three uh, uh, concepts uh, relate today. Uh, because a lot of people say uh, the content of the platform is uh, the uh, media-related uh, uh, let's say, uh, relations in the form of a network, right? So the, so the platform is in, in itself almost a Hegelian uh, synthesis uh, of the previous uh, expressions, uh, which you can very clearly see with Netflix, for instance, uh, or YouTube, for that matter, where you find all these uh, elements, but they are brought onto a higher level of the platform. Chapter six uh, is, is uh, such an example of a, of a biographic uh, part. Um, there I try to deal with the very dark uh, forms of digitization and uh, there I deal with the question of how, um, let's say, computers and computer networks relate to genocide. Uh, it goes back also to the to the Holocaust. In this uh, chapter, I, think I go through uh, the role of uh, of IBM and, and the role of IBM uh, in the Holocaust, which uh, you know is is a is a story. Yeah, I don't know how many of the contemporary uh, generation knows much uh, about it. At some point in in the 80s and 90s, this was known, and some really good books about it uh, came out. Uh, of course, nowadays we have the big investigation against Facebook 
and the, the role they are playing in the, in the genocide in Myanmar, uh, which is a very, very serious uh, case, uh, um, which uh, you know, may even end up in the, in the, in the, in the court, in the national, international court um, uh, in The Hague, right? Where, where Facebook was actively involved in setting up people uh, violently. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, computer networks are playing uh, a role in all this uh, today, and we can expect, uh, unfortunately, a lot more in that respect. Then I quickly go through smaller uh, issues. Uh, well, of course, the selfie, uh, to, this is related to the conference here in Rome and to the book uh, we are uh, bringing out. This is my uh, contribution uh, in the same way as a mask design, which is kind of part of that because I consider the selfie a, a, as a mask. Uh, it's a, one of the many masks uh, we, we wear, uh, and, uh, and then in uh, 9 and 10 I deal more with the strategic questions, what 9 is, uh, is uh, the European origins in the 90s of uh, the memes, and usually uh, for today's generation memes start with uh, 4chan probably, or something like that, yeah, but uh, the, the idea of memes have been around for a long, long time uh, before you know, before uh, uh, 4chan uh, picked up uh, on it. Um, and the origins go back, in fact, to the 70s. They were kind of further developed in the, in the 80s. And then uh, in the 90s, uh, they, uh, they kind of coincided with, uh, with cyber culture and the rise of, uh, of the internet and uh, the World Wide Web. Okay, so, uh, so it's important there to under understand the, the uh, the larger history uh, there. Okay. And the uh, 10 is again a, a question of uh, you know, how, how in this case we deal with uh, the idea of commons, <coughs> which is a very important and strategic notion uh, in, um, uh, let's say, alternative uh, movements uh, today. Okay, so this, uh, this, is, uh, this is the book. Uh, now I want to go to the last part and read uh, some of the um, uh, parts from Sad by Design. Try and dream, if you can, of a morning app. The mobile has become dangerously close to our psychic bond, to the point where the two can no longer be separated. If only my phone could gently weep. McLuhan's extension of man has imploded right into the exhausted self. Social media and the psyche have fused, turning daily life into a social reality that, much like artificial and virtual reality, is overtaking our perception of the world and its inhabitants. So this is a new term I introduce, social reality. And of course it's very different from, let's say, social realism, right? I mean, uh, I was in Bucharest and I had to explain there, like, okay, this uh, social reality is very different from, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of, uh, you know, uh, terms that you used uh, during communism, right? <laughs> okay, so social reality is a, is a variation, uh, is, a re, is a, re, a reference to social media, where social media becomes reality. Uh, and, it's a, and, and, it, and it's a variation of virtual reality and artificial reality, and I think there is a third one, uh, which is called social reality. And thanks to Donatella, who has uh, always convinced me that uh, the social is, uh, is social, unsocial, is something that is uh, very, very real. Are you on social? Uh, this is, this uh, has always stayed with me. So, this is how I came to social reality. And it, it, that I define as a corporate hybrid between handheld media and the psychic structure of the user. It's a distributed form of social ranking that can no longer be reduced to the interests uh, of state and corporate platforms. And so I don't want it to only, let's say, um, 
focus it on or project it only on those large tech players. Because we have incorporated it. We have we are embodying it. We are social media. As online subjects, we are too implicit, far too deeply involved. Social reality works in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. It's all about you and your profile. Likes and followers define your social status. But what happens when nothing can motivate you anymore? When all the self-optimization techniques fail and you begin to carefully avoid these forms of emotional analytics. Compared to others, your ranking is low and this makes you sad. Omnipresent social media places a claim on our elapsed time, our fractured lives. We're all sad in our own very way. And there are no lulls or quiet moments anymore. The result is fatigue, depletion and loss of energy. We're becoming obsessed with waiting. How long have you been forgotten by your loved one? Minutes? Hours? Time, meticulously measured on every app, tells it to us right in our face. Kronos hurts. Should I post something to attract attention and show that I'm still there? Nobody likes me anymore. At the random messages keep resentlessly piling in. There's no way to hold them, to take a moment and think it all through. Delacroix once declared that every day which is not noted is like a day that does not exist. Diary writing used to fulfill that task, right? When you write a diary, you kind of sum up, you reflect on the day. I don't know if you've done it, but uh, okay. Um, <laughs> try, maybe. <laughs> uh, elements of early blog culture try to update the diary form for the online realm. Yeah, so a lot of the online diaries uh, you find, you know, in that in that period. There's some in the earlier 90s, but uh, they didn't have the blog. Of course, is a is a very easy to use software that uh, facilitates uh, diary writing. Unlike the blog entries of the Web 2.0 era, social media surpassed the summary stage of the diary in a desperate attempt to keep up with real-time regimes. Instagram stories, for example, bring back the nostalgia of an unfolding chain of events and then disappear at the end of the day, like a revenge act, a satire of ancient sentiments gone by. Storage will make the pain permanent. Better forget about it and move on. In the online context, Sadness appears as a short moment of indecisiveness, a flash that opens up the possibility of a reflection. So here I define online sadness uh, as the possibility of reflection. It's not reflection, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a flash uh, you, where you kind of get something, right? But then it disappears. Hmm? Possibility of a reflection. The frequently used sad label is a vehicle, a strange, strange attractor to enter the liquid mass called social media. Sadness is a container. Each and every situation can potentially be qualified as sad. And this is what I learned from my 17-year-old son, Mr. Kazmin, who has always showed to me that, you know, this, for instance, this plastic, this is very sad. So this object is very sad, right? If, in, if maybe you understand. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So each and every object can be sad, right? And will be sad. Um, okay. So when something, 
When something is sad, things around it become grey. You trust the machine because you feel you're in control of it. You want to go from zero to hero. But then your propped up ego implodes and the failure of self-esteem becomes apparent again. The price of self-control in an age of instant gratification is high. We all know that. We long to revolt against the restless zombie inside us, but we don't know how. Our psychic armor is thin and eroded from within, open to behavioral modifications. And in the book, I'm summing up a lot of those uh, uh, ways uh, that recently uh, engineers from Google and Facebook uh, have confessed how they ha have in, uh, indeed done and made those behavioral modifications, right? Uh, so there's, there's a lot now known that wasn't even known, let's say, three or five years ago uh, about how precisely uh, this uh, has, been, uh, has been done. Uh, and the, uh, the role of behavioral scientists there uh, is uh, crucial. Sadness arises at the point we're exhausted by the online world, right? And we all know that moment, right? You've gone through, uh, through it and then you're exhausted. You have to put the phone aside. But then the phone calls again. So you pick it up again, right? But it's that gesture of putting it away. You've had enough, right? Okay. Yet another, uh, after yet another app session, in which we failed to make a date, purchased the ticket, and did a quick round of videos, the post-dopamine mood hits us hard. The sheer busyness and self-importance of the world makes you feel joyless. After a dive into the network, we're drained and feel socially awkward. The swiping finger is tired, and we have to stop. We should be careful to distinguish sadness from anomalies such as suicide, depression, and burnout. Everything and everyone can be called sad, but not everyone is depressed, right? We know that, right? Because depression uh, is a very clearly defined medical term, uh, uh, and sadness is not. So I compare sadness with boredom, for instance, uh, but not with uh, disease. Much like boredom, sadness is not a medical condition. Even though, never say never, because everything can and might be turned into one, right? So even sadness potentially can be eh, medicalized. It, yet, uh, right now, it is not. No matter how brief and mild, sadness is the default mental state of the online billions. Its original intensity gets dissipated, it seeps out, it becomes a general atmosphere. So sadness is very thin, right? So it's the opposite of the very deep feelings. Sadness can be, uh, and this is a, a problem with it, it's, 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 uh, it's flatness is a, in a way uh, what, what defines it. Occasionally, for a brief moment, we feel the loss. The seething rage emerges, right? The anxiety grows. After checking for the tenth time what somebody said on Instagram, the pain of the social makes us feel miserable and we put the phone away. Am I suffering from the phantom vibration syndrome? Wouldn't it be nice if we were offline? Why is life so tragic? He blocked me. At night, you read through the thread again. Do we need to quit again, to go cold turkey again? Others are supposed to move us, arouse us, and yet we don't feel anything anymore. The heart is frozen. Sadness has neighboring feelings we can check out. There is the sense of worthlessness. Blankness, joylessness, the fear of accelerating boredom, the feeling of nothingness, plain self-hatred while trying to get off drugs dependency, 
those lapses of self-esteem, laying low in the mornings, those moments of being overtaken by a sense of dread and alienation up to your neck in crippling anxiety. There is the self-violence panic attack and deep dependency, dependency before we cycle all the way back to a reoccurring despair. We can go into the deep emotional territory of the Russian Tosca. And, and I, I'm very interested to look more into uh, more specific, more cultural uh, expressions. Uh, but because uh, um, my Russian translator said, the yeah, said by design is a, a utterly un, uh, um, uh, unimpressive uh, essay for us because we are always sad. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so the, the Russian Tosca uh, goes, uh, let's say, three layers deeper mm -hmm. than what you have described here as a very, very uh, uh, artificial s surface phenomena that, uh, you know, uh, is not relating to us. And I, I took that uh, critique uh, as a, a very serious uh, one, okay? So we, we, can, we should become more... Uh, uh, culturally specific and try to uh, zoom in further on these very specific cultural and also gender specific uh, uh, modes of uh, stagnation and despair, right? Online despair can take many, many forms. Or we can think of online sadness as part of a moment of cosmic loneliness, Albert Camus, imagined after God created the earth, right? The cosmic loneliness. I wish that every chat was never ending, but what to do when your inability to, to respond take over, right? So the inability to respond, I take very, very serious. I think we just saw the no message is also a message, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Now that is a very, very uh, important uh, thing to further go through, right? So the, non the inability to respond to the other is a very, very constitutional feeling uh, of the online uh, world, right? And we all know what we're talking about here. You're heartbroken and delete the session after yet another stretch of compulsory engagement with those cruel likes, silly comments, empty text messages, detached emails, and vacuous selfies, you feel empty and indifferent. You hover for a moment, vaguely unsatisfied. You want to stay calm, yet start to lose your edge, disgusted by your own Facebook memories. But what's this message that just came in? Hmm, strange. Did they respond? Anxieties that go untreated build up to a breaking point. Yeah, we know that. So yeah, the question is, uh, is the sadness culminating? Uh, is it, is it uh, growing to a certain point where things completely break down? Unlike the burnout, sadness is a continuous state of mind. Sadness pop up, the, s the second events start to fade away. And now you're down in the rabbit hole once more. Perpetual now can no longer be captured and leaves us isolated, a scattered set of online subjects. What happens when the soul is caught in the perpetual present? It, is this what Franco Berardi calls the slow cancellation of the future? By scrolling, swiping and flipping, we hungry ghosts try to fill the existential emptiness, frantically searching for a determining sign and failing. When the phone hurts and you cry together, that's technological sadness. I miss your voice. Call, don't text. Thank you very much.
So I think we should open the floor for questions. We touched upon so many issues that are so relevant for our contemporary life. So, yeah, thank you. Hi, Bert. Welcome, Rob. Uh, in your um, 2008, uh, well, 2006 book, uh, uh, Zero Commerce, yes. you talk about uh, digital nihilism. Mm. Uh, what's the difference between the, the these yeah. two approaches to nihilism? In the Thanks case? so much, because I have not thought about this yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, to be honest, I, uh, I noticed Basically, when the book uh, uh, was already in production, um, I have chosen, I have to say, that in 2005 and 6, I made an extensive study uh, about what is the role of nihilism today, right? And there, I looked not so much in the, in the 19th century, let's say, the romantic form of nihilism, uh, which, you, which you, we can find in the early writings, uh, also of the anarchists, but uh, all of Nietzsche and so many others, right? Uh, who are dealing with this existential emptiness. Um, so, um, so I'm not talking about uh, that kind of romantic um, uh, notion, um, which Nietzsche uh, obviously wanted to uh, express, but also overcome at the same time. Right? Uh, in 2006, uh, yeah, you, you know this, uh, you, know this <laughs> you know the, the Twitter feed, I don't know, uh, if you follow me, this, but okay. Um, yeah, this is a nice, uh, it's a tribute to the 19th century, of course, yeah. and <laughs> to our Danish friend, uh, Kirka, um, who has also written about this. Um, the, the 2006 version of this is very much uh, related to the question of the inability to really uh, respond to the comment section of blogs. Uh, and the, the comment section of blogs we, we experience coming from the uh, 80s and 90s really as an early form of regression. Because uh, it was no longer uh, let's say the threads that we knew from the, the forum software in which you know you, you were discussing together and there was a, a sense of equality and community and you were trying to figure out something uh, together. You know, in the same way as you can still find in some of the Wikipedia pages where people really discuss and really try, okay, you know, we're not, we, we don't agree, but uh, we can still find that on email lists as well, right? Where people just go in, um, the, the comment culture that the blog software was introducing, in my understanding, was a nihilistic one. Hmm? And that's why the zero comments eh, uh, on, uh, in the blogs was for me uh, symbolic uh, for, for something. And the nihilism there also for me was a very numerical thing because it was a referencing to nihil which means zero, right? Zero. So it, it was about one and zero. And, and it was about the, the, the kind of meaning of the zero in uh, early 2000, uh, yeah, what was then already called web 2.0 culture. Uh, nowadays, I think that the online, the nihilism, uh, it takes, a, a, it's very, very big. And it's almost a genre. I think, uh, yeah, the dark web is the genre, uh, you know, I think. Yeah. Um, so um, it's, it's even more than, than a general uh, condition. It's much, much more than that. And uh, yeah, it has therefore also cultivated itself and, and yes, can be identified. So. There is a connection. Between there is a connection. Yeah. There is a, yeah, but, but it's one that uh, is exponential. Uh, I don't know, last start and then pass uh, I just wanted to first of all thank you uh, for the amazing presentation. Uh, I had a, a question that may seem banal. Uh, I was in I was very I studied banal. 
Uh, I was very curious of the differentiation between the Marxist ideology and the social media ideology because uh, I see a lot of similarities between Marxist ideology and social media, for instance, the animation, the individualism, and uh, even uh, uh, further on the ideology of the, of the veil itself. So I was wondering if you could expand on that and maybe explain uh, what you meant by the differentiation between social media ideology and Marxist ideology. Yeah. Okay, well, of course, there are, within Marxism, there are many, many def definitions, right, of mm -hmm. ideology. And I come from the 70s, so we uh, extensively studied first uh, Gramsci, of course, and then uh, Althusser and um, uh, Violet Terborn and, and many, many others uh, who are part of this uh, kind of late 70s, early 80s debate in Marxism what, uh, what ideology uh, means today. Mm -hmm. Not only what it maybe meant for the, uh, for the earlier Marx or for the later Marx, but uh, in today's society. Um, I think uh, in, at that time we were still uh, emphasizing a lot uh, the role of these so-called uh, you know, uh, uh, ideological state apparatuses, as uh, um, uh, Althusser uh, coined them, right? Uh, the family, the church, the school, uh, the, the, uh, the army barracks, uh, the, uh, uh, the jail, uh, also, of course, the, 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 uh, their histories uh, have been uh, described by uh, Michel Foucault uh, and given a, given a history. Uh, uh, it's, it's that framework. But today, I find it really difficult to put the, the social media, because social media for me is so much more. It's a co kind of almost like a, an ecology. Right? So I come from also from that part where, where it starts to become like a sphere, almost uh, also like in a way uh, sort of that uh, describes it. Huh? it. It's kind of a, a, it surrounds us, we breathe, we breathe it, but we, uh, in the same way as we now breathe, uh, you know, oxygen, but we don't notice that we do. Huh? So it, it, for me, it has uh, turned into that. Was the question? Yeah. I saw, oh. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I was wondering if you know this guy, uh, he's a pioneer in digital minimalism. Uh, it's called uh, Carl Newport. And uh, he doesn't have Facebook, he doesn't have any social media, but he keeps, uh, you know, expanding his audience with uh, TED Talks and uh, also with uh, uh, newsletters trying to promote digital minimalism. If you, what do you think of uh, this kind of uh, approach to social media? Uh, and also... If I don't know him, sorry. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so you don't, no one knows him, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, if you could no I, I, please come down and, and write it down and then I, I, I can try to find out about it. So. Uh, if you could explain a little bit better about you know, the, behavioral, uh, the behavioral tricks that Google and Facebook use to engage us in more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in the book, I try to list uh, these um, things that uh, uh, in a way are in a, uh, in a written and uh, given in a strange form of a confession, almost a Catholic confession. Yeah? Um, that, that's kind of the, the mode in which we uh, uh, find those uh, people that, that come out. It, they are not quite whistleblowers, but they know. Uh, yeah? But maybe it's a border case, maybe it's something like that. Still, I, you know, I, I, I find it very, very interesting. But of course, we, yeah, we cannot really know, uh, you know, is there any truth to what they say? Well, uh, what has their role uh, really been right, inside the company? Um, this is often uh, very difficult to find out. But nonetheless, uh, you know, every uh, um, information that escapes uh, you know, this, uh, is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, this morning I was listening to a podcast, for instance, about which was only focusing for, for an hour, focusing on the way Google tries to keep secret uh, 
the, uh, the algorithm and the, the, the man manipulation it does on the recommendation mm -hmm. uh, of the videos of mm -hmm. YouTube, right? Yeah? Because people want, uh, people are tweaking this all the time. They're trying to figure out, you know, how to come higher uh, into the hierarchy and so on, and so on, right? Yeah? And yes, so if somebody would uh, come up and, and tell us something <laughs> about that, uh, yeah, that's very valuable. So that such information uh, is. Um, Um, I'm working on a, on a small project about Instagram and uh, in the digital culture, and I'm interested in the connection between speed and this current acceleration also brought by capitalism mm -hmm. and, and uh, social networks, social media. Um, you've talked a lot about sad, sadness and anxiety related to the use of, uh, of different media platforms. Mm -hmm. Is this because we are not maybe also able to keep up with this pace? That's yeah, 100%, um, and I come from, uh, let's say, the, the I'm a crossbreed between uh, Baudrillard and Virilio. Uh, so uh, the Baudrillard side is more the seductive uh, side, the Virilio side is more the material side, which is focusing on speed. And yes, if you want to say that, uh, I apply here uh, Virilio's uh, ideas uh, to the mental online state. Uh, online, which is a, an in a inability to properly respond to uh, real-time communication, which we, in, which is for us impossible uh, to keep up with, right? And so, and that's also what draws us back. Of course, there are other elements, but it's the speed and uh, uh, which is so so important uh, because uh, it's it's a culture defined by updates, right, by news feeds, by things that are uh, constantly uh, happening. Uh, and yes, uh, the fear of missing out is very real. Huh? Uh, and it, it, it is, it's driven and defined by this uh, culture of speed. No doubt. Because there is no <coughs> linearity anymore, right? In a film, you look at the film and then you after which the film is over and then you see start to reflect on it, you talk about it with your friends, eh? same with reading a book. Eh? Now this is the classical form uh, of narration which then comes to an end and then you reflect on it. With social media this is completely and utterly impossible. Um, uh, okay. uh, so you've been talking about um, anxiety, sadness, depression related to social media and I wanted to ask how do you think the university, I don't know if it's too much on the top of this question, but how do you think the university should take care of the students? How do you think uh, professors should handle this? Because we don't, we're not really, you're talking to like the majority of us are students. Mm -hmm. We don't really know what to do because we're not educated enough to, to tackle this, to handle this in our lives. Sure. We're very yeah. young, we're not, mm -hmm. we're not experts, and we don't no. know how to face yeah. sadness. You know, and there are very, uh, unfortunately, very, few experts on this, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. What would you do in a very practical well, way? Well, I mean, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, look at what uh, Donatella is doing in her class. I think that this is a really important uh, start. Take it seriously and, and not just see it as one of the many topics, but really, really go deep in, into it. Uh, give uh, everybody space to, uh, to talk about it. Uh, and uh, yes, that's, this is also what, uh, what I try um, uh, to do and, and to see that these problems are not your own problems, that these are defined, that these are defined by software settings. It's, that it's, it's confronting. I know this uh, idea is very confronting, but yes, a lot of these feelings are machine generated. And, uh, and this, is, this is often very, very difficult to accept, to find out, to, uh, to uh, yeah. Because, because they're all ultra personal, huh? very, very intimate things, right? And how can these in intimate things that hit you so hard be machine generated, right? This is such a contradiction.
but it's our reality, yeah? your reality. But reality of, in my opinion, billions of people, right? We're not talking about some hmm? small group of people. Right? We know social media is now uh, ubiquitous. It, it's everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is, uh, uh, let's say, living under uh, this regime, under these uh, conditions. And I hope that um, you know many many people uh, will come on, on, on board and uh, by talking about it, by studying it, by taking it serious, by coming together, uh, uh, we can make a start. Thank you. Um, sorry. So you discussed earlier the fact that you have like an unsure relationship about including biographies in your work. And so um, I'm in the Southeast and the Network Identities Club with um, Professor Galarraza. And so we had to read um, the article that you published, I'm not sure exactly when, but the title was that by design. And the biographies for me, I think, are really important in kind of explaining what you're trying to get across, especially to younger audiences. Because I think for me personally, I was forced to confront the fact that I related to some of the stories that you put forward. And I think that's a really good way to get young people into this realization of like what's actually going on. Because um, in your other article, you mentioned that um, Zizek's like, idea of they know what they do, but they do it anyway. And I think that what I realized by reading both of those articles and like self-analyzing is that even though a lot of the time younger people who have spent most of our adult lives in like the process of individuation with social media, we know what's going on, but we refuse to really confront it. So we look, but we do not see. And so I think that the inclusion of biographies is something that's been really powerful because um, at the beginning of the class, we were all asked um, to disclose how much time a day we tend to spend like screen time. And I had like an average of six hours a day, which is not healthy. <laughs> but I realized that after reading your piece and actually confronting a lot of my own personal excuses and normalizing the idea of being digitalized and like the pervasiveness and the fact that I think a lot of people who went through the process of individuation on social media, we do not separate our identities from our social identities because the entire time that we acknowledged who we were, we were acknowledging it in front of other people. Um, I then like cut down my time to like two hours um, and 18 minutes a day, which I'm really proud of. <laughs> that might not be the greatest thing, but I'm really proud of it. Um, and so I just wanted to ask though about, you mentioned the use of social media and memes sort of to try and get the word out in a time where um, Europe is so turbulent and like right wing politics are like so pervasive and like prevalent. Um, I wanted to ask if you felt like there was a need to kind of make those memes or the social media posts more effective or um, emotionally stimulating just because of the whole like um, Jody Dean's idea of uh, circulation or if there was going to be like a moral understanding of not trying to pull on people's heartstrings too much and possibly succumbing to having a message that isn't heard because so many people are speaking at the same time. Yeah, this would go deep into the question of the memes, uh, meme as strategy. Uh, but thanks a lot for your, uh, for your question and uh, your uh, remark. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, yeah, uh, that you have, uh, you know, started to investigate uh, this. And I would really uh, love to encourage you all to go deeper into it because uh, it, it just doesn't happen a lot. As you say, uh, you know, you, you see it, uh, uh, and, uh, but, um, you know, you, you don't see it. What, what did you say? Um, you look yeah, you look, you look, but you don't see, but you feel, right? Mm -hmm. So you, yet you feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, so you, you, you feel it. Um, yeah, the, um, the, the investigation into uh, these uh, affective realms, into these uh, emotional registers, 
uh, is important. Uh, it's important also from an anti-fascist uh, perspective, I believe, because if we understand how uh, you know our psychic armor really works, how we can be manipulated in an unconscious way, hmm? uh, then uh, we can start doing something uh, about it. Because why are certain ideas uh, appealing uh, to us? Uh, of course, it's, it starts, first, first of all, uh, to admit that they exist and that they are appealing. Otherwise, you cannot deconstruct them. You can, and if we don't talk about them uh, you know, together, huh, we cannot uh, formulate uh, a political strategy uh, that uh, would be uh, uh, countering uh, these, uh, these agendas that come w with them. Right? So this is my, um, my summary uh, of, the, of the strategies and memes. Uh, because they combine, uh, let's say, images and texts are very uh, interesting uh, ways. If you want to read, um, I have written last year three essays together with Mark Tutors. They're all online and then they're going deeper into the question of uh, meme theory. They're not in the book, but um, they are online. <coughs> and there I, I try to answer uh, these questions. I, I do want to say something more about the, the biography the biographic element, because I admit it's very important. Uh, yeah, maybe for academic theorists, for activists, it's not so uh, a very uh, obvious thing to do, to dive into the self or to, to write uh, autobiographically uh, about these things and the struggles and, the, and even your, your personal relations because maybe you feel like you know who am I and why uh, I mean there are so many big questions in society and yeah so I had to overcome this uh, and yeah I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle uh, of, uh, of this and I try to also let's say write, develop a, a history a writing of the history that is maybe different uh, if we are confronting let's say uh, now the history, especially of the 80s and 90s, and you know that uh, you know that the, the history of the 90s is now becoming more, yeah, more important. So how how will how will we define the writing of the history of such of such periods in which uh, you know uh, you you grew up in you you were born in, in that in that period. Thank you, Kim, for your um, inspiring presentation today. I have um, a question about um, uh, what um, do you think about the idea uh, that technology is um, a perpetual object? So it's like uh, something that, so it's, it's not only technology, mm -hmm. it's this um, tendency of people, uh, of human beings, uh, to prefer the parts instead of the totality of the alterity, because the totality mm -hmm. of the alterity is kind of yeah. uh, scary, yeah. difficult to deal with, yeah. unbearable, uh, blah, blah, blah. And so we, we go for the partial object, which yeah. is pornography, but it's not only for pornography, it's everything, mm -hmm. no? You can, you can mm -hmm. explain every situation in terms of uh, partial object. Uh, do you think that this is the case? And, and if this is the case, what kind of partial object is the mobile phone? Well, first of all, I think it's important to agree <laughs> that, the, that the mobile phone is a partial, partial object. And that would be the starting point of a whole new theory that I have not uh, uh, read yet or have seen that anyone uh, is even coming close to this uh, point, right? So your, um, uh, your proposal here is, uh, is really new, right? And it is, it's part of, let's say, what I see as a, a call uh, coming from, from my side that uh, a lot more uh, of the more traditional uh, psychoanalytic 
uh, you know, scholars should seriously come on board uh, with with this, right? I, I don't consider myself, a, you know, an amateur psychoanalyst. I, I don't know exactly uh, what my status is. I, have, have. I of course, I, I grew up with uh, with Freud, and, and this is a very, very important part of my, uh, uh, of, yeah, of my scholarly uh, uh, training, um, and also of who I am. Uh, but um, you know. The, so far, we have not seen any, any, anyone taking this uh, very, very uh, serious. Although already billions of people are walking around with this object so close to them, huh? which means so much of them, right? So, uh, the study of this uh, it hasn't even started. Huh? Uh, we don't know anything uh, about it. <coughs> For instance, the relationship between that partial object and uh, you know, what in the Melanie Klein tradition uh, is called the psychic arm, uh, for instance. Uh, that, that relationship, for instance, uh, which is, in my view, uh, very, very uh, important. Right? <coughs> because the, it, it, the, this partial object somehow breaks through very weak parts or weak points in the, in the psychic arm. Right? And this is, this is kind of also why it hurts, and this is what I tried to describe in the sad and sad essay, right? It's that particular point, hmm? uh, which is there. Hmm? Um, yeah, uh, what can, I, I don't think I can say more about it than, um, than uh, let's, uh, and, and uh, you know, we are trying, uh, we are a small group, we four, try to do something uh, with the theory of the selfie, huh? uh, which is going precisely uh, in the same uh, direction. Of course, the selfie, we can say, okay, it's just a photograph, uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a very, very important uh, uh, part of our uh, online life. hasn't gone away. Uh, it's not a fad. Uh, um, unlike many, what many, many people thought, uh, it's, not going, uh, it's not going away. Uh, so, uh, because it's so, so uh, closely part, because uh, it's, it's part of a, a mirror, right? So that part, that partial object uh, is uh, also a mirror, right? And, and so the, the, the selfie is used uh, as, a, as, a, as a mirror. And then also that, uh, you know, a mirror, let's say, the Lacanian uh, sense. goes very, very deep, right? <laughs> and we haven't, uh, we haven't really touched the surface. Sometimes I, I do more uh, work on, for instance, the formation of the profile. Then the very, very starting point, maybe nobody uh, here in this hall remembers how, how you got onto those platforms, right? but if you start digging, remember, you went to that website, and the first thing it asked uh, is to create a profile, right? So the, pro the creation of the profile is a constitutional uh, moment, right? And there you define, as we know, uh, and, 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 and then we have to already, there you have to see, you know, what kind of questions are asked. A few people here in this hall come from the, the World Wide Web and the Internet before the profile. The profile did not exist, right? Most of us, uh, it, you, you were not even asked for a username, let alone uh, that you could, uh, you know, choose whatever username. There were even times when there wasn't even a username. Hmm? Uh, yeah. So the, the, the definition of uh, and, the, and the, the, the framing of the way uh, uh, th this profile is is created uh, and almost. You can almost do it blindly because remember you are creating quite a lot of profiles and you almost forget because you can do it all or already very fast. And in the, in, the, in the creation of most profiles, it asks you, in fact, if you want to import your Facebook and Google profiles already. So it goes; it's almost uh, automated uh, these days, right? So I've taken out a very, very tiny, small part of that story, right? 
Of course, the story starts after you create the, the, the profile. Right? So, uh, and by becoming aware of what you do, and, but this is very, very difficult, by self-consciously studying every second, every step you make, you, you see, you, you start to dig into the ideology, the choices these engineers made, right? Uh, a lot of them are invisible, a lot of them can be reconstructed, you can read about it, but hmm, it's very, very tiresome uh, to do. So this deconstruction of the social reality, as I call it, uh, is a huge uh, undertaking, right? And also because we are there, uh, you know, with literally billions of people, so, you know, we're not talking about some minor detail here, right? This is really, really important and, and defining stuff, defining not just only about the online reality, but especially also it defines yourself. It defines the self that you are, right? And uh, so this is why uh, that mix uh, is so interesting and so important to study. Thank you for that. <coughs> Other questions? Okay. Mike, want to take the advantage of like just asking you if uh, there are no for the moment. No, because I really like the you know, idea of the empathic uh, criticism. I think this is something really important that we should do as scholars, but also as artists, because as you said, I mean, there's a little bit of despise for autobiography uh, experiences, like everything that deals with emotion, there's a little bit, especially in the tradition of progressive left, uh, kind of uh, left aside. So I think we should uh, regain that kind of place. Reclaim. Uh, yeah, regain the empathic criticism. I would like uh, to ask you to talk more about, uh, in, in, in terms of like, this empathic criticism of the idea of the digital detox, because a couple of weeks ago there was an article on the New York Times saying the new wealth is to be offline. And so basically the article was yeah. talking about this kind of digital yeah. divide that is sure. created today, yeah. which is exactly like this kind of idea that, uh, I mean, some minorities, wealthy minorities, especially in the Western part of the world, they have the luxury of uh, disconnecting. Okay, I don't want to go very deep into it because there's a 45 minutes uh, television documentary which is precisely about this. I, I was part of the research team of that documentary. It's in English, so you can look at it. Uh, it's uh, made by Dutch television, by VPRO, and you can very easily remember it because it's called Offline is the New Luxury. So offline, the new luxury, uh, if you uh, put that in, uh, uh, in your search, uh, you will find this documentary. Uh, Sherry Turkle is in it. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of people who uh, go into this question also of, uh, of the new elite. Uh, because we know that, because the new elite, much like the, the really, really important influences, right? The, the bigger you are an influencer, the more you have delegated your online presence, right? This is very, this is a very um, paradoxical, huh? difficult to understand. But the, the, the more uh, uh, you are uh, known, the, the, the you know the bigger uh, your fame as a celebrity, the more you have delegated this. Huh? Uh, and there are really there are big companies already doing this, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so. So uh, there, the, the, the offline uh, reality, uh, you, can, you can really see that it, it is something that you can buy. You can buy it, huh? if you are wealthy enough. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the more you go down, uh, especially, uh, let's say, in, uh, in Brazil, in, in big parts of Africa, in, in, in India, uh, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people cannot afford to be offline. There is no way, right? Their, their, their families are depending on it. They need to know. They, they traffic, they're in traffic two, four times a day, uh, four hours a day, right? Uh, they need to be traceable, trackable. 
They need to coordinate their very, very busy online lives. Many, many people have two or three jobs on this planet, right? And the only way they can do that uh, is by being uh, online all the time to coordinate. They have kids and so on and so on. So uh, the, the busy lives uh, need to be coordinated, right? So there's no way that, the, let's say, the global proletariat uh, is a, can afford uh, to be uh, offline. Thank you for the tips. Uh, I think we should screen this documentary. It's definitely, I will mean, look something really interesting to look at uh, together on this very topic. Um, yeah. Um, do you think that this whole uh, feeling of sadness that is associated with being online and knowing that, um, I don't know, like no one uh, actually is interested about what you're writing or <laughs> no one has replied to you. Do you think this is something that is only about, let's say, normal people? Uh, or is it like even people famous on uh, the internet, do they feel still the same thing? Like it, it's an inevitable situation that uh, is related with uh, just being online or is it just... Okay. Well, in the essay, I, I dig into it, but uh, I, I was a bit tempted to go there, but uh, I decided not to say so much about it because it's very obvious that the, the online sadness of today can be uh, compared to the many, many manifestations in history of uh, melancholia. Huh? And uh, so, um, uh, so th and there are a lot of uh, similarities uh, uh, there. And of course, sadness, um, uh, as, a, as a phenomena uh, existed uh, before, uh, so there's there's no doubt uh, about that. But um, the big difference is that uh, I, in in this essay I try to make a, a link between uh, let's say the the settings, the design choices, the behavioral modifications, uh, the recommendations, the way to capture uh, the uh, attention. Uh, the way we, we've, we've brought back time and again to, to updates and so on and so on, all these mechanisms, they are technological in nature. And that, in my understanding, is a relatively new phenomenon. Maybe, uh, maybe people will uh, write uh, an archaeology of the technological sadness, I hope. Uh, <laughs> and maybe, <laughs> maybe it already existed in the 19th century, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but, uh, you know, please do so. Uh, but, yes, I, for the time being, I think uh, this is a relatively new thing that uh, has uh, happened over the last uh, 10, 15 years. <laughs> Other questions? You want to ask another question? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Please. Um, sorry. So my question was to do with what you were talking about earlier about um, uh, poorer countries and economies not being able to afford the luxury of being offline. I am from Zimbabwe, and I think what I've realized through doing a lot of this, um, a lot of studying kind of media theory and relationships with the internet and social media is that I think there is a sort of level of geographic specificity in which theories do apply. Because for Zimbabweans, a lot of people have um, migrated for like decades and decades outside of the country because there's not a lot of resources and so on. And so in the 1980s, people had to write letters that would take three months to their closest relatives, whereas now, for the most part, um, the internet access has made it so that people now have this ability to communicate regardless of how poor you are and like social media has given that opportunity because it's a lot less dependent on people having the amount of money to make an overseas call or uh, send a letter. And so um, I just wanted to ask if you've kind of considered sort of the scope of the application of these theories and sort of more um, non-Western countries in the context in which they may feel like they may be able to build their relationships with social media? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
the role of migrant communities uh, in the internet uh, has been, uh, you know, with us ever since uh, the 90s. Uh, so uh, this has been uh, studied uh, carefully already for, for quite some time. And this phenomenon uh, so exists, it goes really back to um, those years so when the internet opened up and immediately started to become uh, uh, apparent because uh, it was very cheap and it's in real time. As you said, um, yeah. I mean, um, in terms of boundaries, you know, I mean, I mean we all know those boundaries. Um, uh, it, it really depends for the migrant communities also of a banal fact of uh, time difference, right? If the time difference is five or ten hours or something like that, uh, something really, uh, something else starts to uh, starts to develop, right? Uh, if there is no time difference. Huh? Uh, but there is a lot of geographical and cultural difference. Yeah? Uh, we see that uh, there is an incredible uh, presence, even up to the point of very oppressive uh, presence of the other who is, uh, you know, in the, uh, who is left behind or who has left. Uh, so the, the, the element of uh, liberation, really, of your ties, where you come from, yeah? uh, might be even more, uh, might become even more difficult because people can live the lives they have in another place elsewhere, right? Including also the cultures and the oppressive uh, relationships within the family, within the tribe, within the communities where they come from and they take those with them to the new places. So uh, um, we should be uh, at least a little bit ambivalent uh, about about this, right? It's not unproblematic uh, uh, this 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 type, because r remember, with internet, you are uh, not only in communication, you are traceable, you are trackable, and uh, for 24 hours a day, the other uh, is following you. Uh, we know very well what that means, right? Uh, and you want this to stop hmm? at some point, uh, but within very traditional tribes, families, etc., communities, this is not possible. So, or not so easy, let's say, to do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I, I'm not really sure if the internet there uh, is uh, such a brilliant uh, gift.